Dr. Jeremy Weiss here. I'm founder of InspiredInsider.com where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. Today, it's been too long. We have Max Teitelbaum. Max is COO and co-founder of What Runs Where, which is a competitive intelligence platform for buying ads online. They help you keep track of your competition, spy on top performing campaigns, and see what's working. Max also teaches at Baylor University Center for Entrepreneurship and mentors other startups through Grow Labs. Max, thanks for joining me. Thanks so much for having me, Jeremy. I'm very excited. I always like to include a fun fact so people get to know you a little bit. The fun fact about you is you're an avid bass fisherman. Not just bass, really just fishing. Oh, fishing. Period, if it's trout, pike, bass. How did you get into fishing? When I was about 12, my father said, um, my, my dad was really busy growing up and said that we could have a week to do whatever we want with him. And I, I picked the, you know, sort of classic father son trip of fishing. And I fell in love with um, the, the activity and have been hooked. I find, yeah, ever hooked, since. yeah. Well, what I find interesting about that, Max, is another fun fact is when we went to a conference together, we roomed together. Most people don't know that, but um, you are, your mind seems to always be working and you seem to be all over the place with your entrepreneurial endeavors. How do you sit still fishing for that amount of time? <laughs> it's a good question. I mean, it's sort of um, the other side of the coin. So, it's the balance in my life where I'm, I'm unplugged. I'm not plugged into the internet. I'm not plugged into work. I'm not thinking about the business. I'm just thinking about one thing. And it's a very tangible um, input output activity. Right. Meaning either you're going to pull something out of the lake <laughs> or, or you're not. And <clears throat> there's no did I succeed. There's either success or failure. Right. 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 Um, so while doing that, I, you know, I, I get to unwind and think a little bit. Some of our best ideas and sort of innovation comes out of that. Yeah, I, I thought you'd say that. So what cool innovations or you know, ideas you had that you brought to the business you got from when you were just kind of sitting calmly on the water? A lot of, a lot of it actually has to do with um, personnel and personnel decisions we make here. Mm-hmm. Um, we were 21 people as a company. And when you grow and when, when it started, it was my partner and myself. And mm-hmm. when you had 19 other people to the team, there are a lot of different things you have to look at and take care of mm-hmm. there. Um, other things may just be how to handle specific business problems, like mm-hmm. should where should we allocate funds? Should we go to this trade show or that trade show? Or, um, you know, do I have something that I need to address and, you know, give some critical thought to? Yeah. So what's one that you remember that you basically came to that realization when you were fishing? Sure. So, I mean, I think uh, a moment that that was sort of pivotal is we were – looking to make a decision probably two years ago about which direction to take the business. Do we want to really delve into mobile advertising or do we want to go into sort of video advertising? And they're two very divergent and very technically different things. Yeah. And we, you know, the, we were looking at it and we were completely torn and it wasn't the overall influencer, but I did a fair amount of the groundwork and thinking of, you know, where is the industry going? Where are the trends going? While well, I was on my boat, mm-hmm. and so where, where, what did you decide? We well, we we launched the first mobile intelligence platform for advertising, and then we launched the first in-app advertising intelligence platform as well. So, do you think that was the right decision? I, if I had to again, I would have made the exact same decision. Mm-hmm. I think it was a phenomenal decision. We've been a market leader in that space since day one, and. Um, I think it's we're as a self-funded business. It's provided revenue to help us continue to grow, so that's yeah. important as well. Yeah, I asked that question, Max, because I think as entrepreneurs or business people, we don't decompress enough. You know, I speak for myself too, and and so it's good to hear you say that to reinforce. Maybe sometimes we should take a break and think a little bit. Yeah, well, I mean, in my first business, I didn't. Um, take a break at all. And it, it's actually a major learning I, I, I found from my first business to this one was with my first one, I burnt out really hard where you're working, you know, 15 hours a day without a break and you do that for a couple of years and then you don't want to work anymore because you, your body needs a break and your mind needs a break at some right. point. And I find if you force yourself to take that break from time to time, you're actually more productive throughout the rest of the time that you have to put in that work. Yeah. 
So I want to talk about what runs where, but first, so tell people what you were doing before what runs where. Sure. So when I was 15, I founded um, a small performance marketing agency, meaning I was an affiliate for offers. I promote various offers, got paid on a cost per acquisition to do that, mm -hmm. and when I actually bought advertising um, for those offers, drove sales to those offers and got paid for those sales. Mm -hmm. um, I did fairly well with that business. And out of that, the concept for What Runs Where sort of came around because my partner actually built the first version of What Runs Where for our own internal use as affiliates. And um, only after we had built it and started using it, we, we realized that this was a huge opportunity to build a phenomenal company. Yeah. I mean, most 15 year olds are playing sports, they're watching TV. How did you get into doing this? I mean, the, the original story is um, I, I was never the most popular kid growing up. I had a fair amount of extra time on my hands. I, I played competitive basketball growing up, but either, you know, you, you don't realize how much spare time you have on your hands until you actually look at it. And I read an article about how people were making money on Second Life, which was a virtual world at the time. Mm -hmm. The key with Second Life is there was a currency there that could be brought into U.S. dollars. So I said, you know, if they're doing it, why can't I? So without any experience or anything, I went in there and found some arbitrage opportunities in that game and started to make a little bit of money there. And within a month or two, I made a couple thousand dollars. And when you're 15, making a couple thousand dollars is like, I'm, I'm the richest guy in the you world. Are, yeah. like, you know? <laughs> um, but through that, I met some people that were heavily involved in online marketing and affiliate marketing and learn a fair bit about that industry from them and sort of jump full into that and then never look back. And mm -hmm. that path has sort of brought me to where we are today. So with, you know, when you decide to start What Runs Where, what did you do first? Well, it was actually my partner, Mike, who had the idea for the software. Mike is one of the smartest guys I know. And Mike and I have been friends. Mike was Mike's also around my age. Mike was 16 when I met him. Mm -hmm. um, How'd you meet? So just through the, we got introduced by a mutual friend, and we saw each other at trade shows and conferences, and we did a little bit of work together and um, became good friends. So we were talking. I said, I'm building this phenomenal piece of you know software that I think is really great. And I said, Well, you know, I think there's a, a lot bigger application for what, what we're building besides just ourselves mm -hmm. and that was sort of the genesis for the unnamed company at the time that would then become what runs where so what was the initial when you decided to partner up and team up what did you do first to get it out there well i mean what what people don't realize as a no, as a non-technical founder i'm more technical than most people but i'm not technical enough to actually write the core technology that we have mm -hmm. um when you're building a when you're building a technology, a lot of the non-technical founder, what they do is a lot of like work. So setting things up, organizing business process, setting up incorporations and documents and processing. But at some point in that process, you're just a cheerleader because you can't launch anything until the product's done. Mm -hmm. So you have to be encouraging and sort of patient and understand things will get done in good time and just try and do as much back work as you can there in terms of recruiting customers, getting, you know, um, signed agreements for sales, all that kind of stuff. But mm -hmm. at the end of the day, until you have a product to sell, you can't do that much. Yeah. And you, what did the early product do and look like? Because you were probably using it internally, right? Yeah. I mean, our, our core product's function hasn't changed that much over the past four years. Um, the early product collected advertisements from around the web, said here's who was advertising, here's where they were placed, and put that into a database and allowed you to search. Um, our, our current product still does that now, we just do it a lot more efficiently, better, and with a lot of different dimensions, so we categorize data better. We have made insights for our clients within our platforms to help them utilize that data better. Obviously, there's the entire mobile piece and then it's about presenting that data to people in the platform in a better more digestible way as well so um not just throwing a bunch of raw data at them but actually making it useful right. for people yeah and a lot of people have software you know obviously comes from them needing it themselves how did you branch out and start to get some of those first customers sure so our first the day that we launched and we were profitable we had 
a couple of beta customers um, that, that paid us quite a lot of money to use the product because there was nothing else like it in the market at that point. Um, those are all just people that we had known and worked with and had existing relationships with. Um, but I remember when our first non beta customer came in and I think that, you know, that was a big point where, where it's like, Hey, I've, I've never heard of this person before in my life. I don't know this person. They don't know me and they're going to pay for my product. And that's a really flattering thing. Mm -hmm. And that, and a lot of that happened and a lot of our growth happened through word of mouth. I mean, we're, we're a technology company. We built great technology and we're really good at what we do. And we, and we feel honored that people respect that and um, speak highly of us. Give people an example, Max, of how people, how one person used it, uses it or used it. Sure. I mean, there are a number of use cases in our product. The, you know, the most direct is as a advertiser, if you're going in and you're running media campaigns, looking at what your competitive set is doing, where they're placing ads, how they're placing ads, who they're placing those ads through and using our indicators to find out what's doing best. And then taking inspiration and um, learning from those ads. So if you can see what tests they've run and, or you can see what placements are doing well for them, you can cut out a lot of the risk within your campaign. Another major use that a lot of our clients use for is sales and prospecting. So a lot of advertising technology companies use us to find new partners and new clients to work with. Mm -hmm. So like if I'm, let's say, a daily deal site, I can go on and see all the ads that Groupon may be running, Living Social may be running, those exactly. that type of thing. And then and then it's about the similarity. So are, is Living Social using the same call to action all their banners? Are they using a consistent theme? Is it a pattern? How how are how is Groupon's ads evolved? Can you see an actual evolution there? And between the two of them, can I see websites that are similar that they're both advertising on? Maybe I should try advertising there too, mm -hmm. because if you use our indicators and say, well, they've been advertising there a long time, they have a high internal score within our system. Mm -hmm. It's probably worth it to go check out, you know, what they're doing mm -hmm. and spend a bit of money testing there. Right. You don't know for sure, but if they've been running it for three years, it's probably working for them. Exactly. Mostly. I mean, most people that work in media are confident enough to, you know, optimize campaigns. Right. So what's some interesting things that you saw from the different, because you probably see so many ads, it makes you sick. What kind of call to actions have you found have been interesting that have worked or what have you seen with different ads, uh, like of the ad elements that have worked? I mean, I, I think more, more than that, we don't notice that as much because that's such a client by client basis, but we see so many ads because we have crawlers that go out on a daily basis in 15 countries that it's really interesting to see trends where you see around an election the certain types of bears that are extraordinarily um, prevalent that, that creep up like around American elections. You see the different parties advertising and see different smear campaigns or even around major sporting events, how the advertising landscape changes for that little bit of time and then sort of snaps back to normal. Hmm. What are some other trends you see? So you see elections, sporting events. What other things do you see? I mean, there's there's obviously seasonal trends to lead up to things like Christmas or Black Friday or um, in, in Canada, um, we have something called Boxing Day, which is another big sales day, mm -hmm. and how those ads change. And you also see a large difference around the end of a quarter in terms of how people's um, ad budgets and spend change because there's budget left over, agencies try and spend it. So you see the mix of um, branded versus performance advertising change a little bit around that time as well. So would you say someone using your service around the holidays may look with a closer eye because people are just spending more money, so it may not be may not be working? Or I mean, I, I don't think that's the takeaway. I think it's how have these people that have traditionally run ads adapted their ads around seasonal events. Mm -hmm. So if you look at an advertiser like Target, Target advertises all through the year, but around the holidays, they run very specific holiday themed ads. And is there a reason why they're, you know, using these specific triggers in their ads? So what kind of triggers have you found that people use around the holidays? I mean, again, that's extraordinarily dependent on a advertiser by advertiser basis and industry by industry basis. There's no sort of specific trigger, but I mean, it may be from their calls to actions changing. Um, or maybe about the type of language they use to communicate deals, right? Um, in a lot of cases, you know, it's about communicating things like free shipping. It's, you know, there's a deal here mm -hmm. ordered by this date. Those type of things are extraordinarily important around those days because people just expect you to, to have them. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, people who are advertising online, what are some big mistakes 
you find people making? Well, the biggest mistake people make is they don't test, right? Mm -hmm. um, and they just put up one thing and they say either it's going to work or it's not. And that's, you know, a huge sort of fallacy. You should always be testing. And we like to think that our tool helps people test more efficiently. But, you know, continually testing. And then um, the other thing that we see, especially with our tools, people think they come into our tool, they copy something and they're going to make money or they're going to be successful. Right. It's understanding that online advertising and the way that you do it is a process and we get you a lot of the way to the process, but um, it's like being given a shiny new Ferrari. You have a really great car, but you still need to be able to drive it right. to get it from A to Z. Right. So what do you tell people that how to best use your service once they see all these competitors and they don't even know what to do with do with them? Again, it's about, it's about taking inspiration. It's about looking for sim on the creative side, it's about looking for similarities. So what if I look at, you know, Groupon, Living Social, and a couple other daily deal sites, and they're all using the same call to action across all those advertisers, that's right. probably something I may want to test. Right. If they're on similar sites, that's something I may want to test. If I'm looking at similar, sim, you know, similar advertiser, just one, let's say, you know, Living Social, are they using um, a certain button style, or are they, you know, are they putting a button in a specific place? And has this changed over time? So one wonderful thing about our data is you can look back over four years. Mm. So you can say over the past four years, how has their advertising changed? And is there a reason why? Yeah, that's really And then it's being yeah. able to take that and test it and figure out what works best for you. Yeah. So what do you see um, a large majority, any specific majority of people using what runs where? Like you see a lot of daily deal sites or what are some other big groups that tend to use your service? I mean, a fair number of performance marketers tend to use our service. Um, a, a number of large brands um, use, our, use our service, and a, a lot of ad agencies use our service as well. Um, I mean, it's not necessarily one concentration, it's more the use case and the type of customer, right? I, th I think as long as you're spending money on display or mobile advertising, our, our service can be extraordinarily useful yeah. to you. I mean, is that one tactic do you ever get customers like let's say you, you mean you probably keep them confidential but let's say you approach target and say you're, you're major one of your major competitors is using us you should be too does that ever happen no i mean we know ne we never do anything like that but we but we would approach somebody like target and say hey look at all this really rich data that we have that we can provide you and here's what we can help you do with it and here's what it means for you yeah uh, so tell me you know max what are some of the big turning points and milestones in the business I think, you know, it's been four and a half years. I think if you look back and reflect, there are some very critical points in a, you know, in a business evolution. Yeah. Um, the first one, obviously, is inception of the idea. The next is actually prototyping and bring it to market. And then during the growth phase, I think a lot of what makes a great business is great people. Yeah. So it's about hiring the right people and putting together the right executive team to help you. Mm -hmm succeed yeah and um you know partially by luck and you know partially by um timing and circumstance i think we've been able to put together you know an absolutely phenomenal executive team yeah um and we've definitely made mistakes on the personnel side but i think as i said great people make a great company and as long as you can identify and correct those mistakes in a proactive manner um, you can continue to build something great. I mean, the the other inflections are, I mean, we we've had we acquired a company about two years ago, and that process was an extremely interesting mm -hmm. process mm -hmm. in terms of starting and closing a transaction, and you know what that looked like, and then trying to absorb another company into ours, and um, you know the the shortcomings that we had there, and the learning that we had, you know, doing that. Um, as well as releasing new product lines and, and sort of evolving to competitive pressure within your space. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, in that, you said a lot there. So, I mean, inception, you prototype, the growth phase. What's an important thing that you had to overcome or do in the inception phase? Um, I mean, we, we were lucky enough that we had a ton of domain expertise, so we knew pretty much exactly what we were doing. It was just about getting it out of the door in a reasonable amount of time so that we were first to market with the product yeah. and and we managed to do that but not by very much we had competitors pretty much the day that we launched um so it's just about being able to um 
sort of stick to vision and realize, you know, if it's the vision that you want to do, execute upon that vision in a timely fashion. Yeah. So what are some things, I mean, at the time too, you probably want to include a lot of great features. What do you leave out at the time? Cause you want to get it out the door and what do you keep in? Well, you want to get the core, your core product. So what, right. what does your company do? You get the base technology there and then you can build in bells and whistles right. after the fact, right? Yeah. Cause there's no point in building all these great bells and whistles. If you go to release your core technology, nobody wants it. True. They just have a really pretty product that nobody uses. So why not release, you know, a functional working product, find customers and get their feedback about what they want to see inside yeah. your product and build for your market instead of what you think your market wants. Yeah, you know, that's an important point, getting feedback. What were they what great feedback did you get that maybe you were surprised by early on? I mean, I think there were there was a large push for international data and expansion there, which is something we did early on. Mm -hmm. And a lot of feedback was tough to hear. I mean, in like the same what? way that it was really, it was really um, humbling to have somebody we didn't know pay for us. It's also really, you know, humbling and slightly upsetting to be honest. To have somebody that you never know tell you your product shit, right? And tell tell you that they don't want to use your that product. That does hurt. Yeah, it's worth anything because this is something that you put your heart and soul into and worked really hard on. Um, and how and how to respond to that is, I think, important. So being able to say, you know, why do you think that, take that information, go and build a better product, you may not be able to retain that customer, but you can understand yeah. what they didn't like about your product and your shortcomings. Yeah. I remember talking to you early on and you had a great process for finding out that feedback, possibly retaining them, but more just finding out that feedback to improve the product. Can you talk a little bit about that process you used? Sure. I mean, we still use a similar process today in terms of we have an entire customer service team here um, where somebody decides to leave our product. We very proactively reach out to them and understand what they didn't do, what they didn't like about our product, yeah. how we can do better. And then we bucket that feedback. So we say we try and find critical masses of areas that we can improve where multiple users want the same thing. Mm -hmm. And then we try and proactively address those concerns. And then we can reach back out to those users and say, look, we've addressed your concern. Come try us again. Maybe you'll like us. And, you know, we hope we've done well enough for you. Yeah. So what were some that surprised you that you kept getting over and over that you wouldn't have known otherwise? I think the surprise wasn't that we could. I think the more surprising things are when we get feedback again and again and again, right. and then we build the feedback and nobody uses it, which mm. has happened a couple of times. Really? Where we get like feedback what? for a feature and we build you know, a certain feature, like we built an ad mock-up tool um, that's a phenomenal resource that people can mock up what ads will look like on websites and drag and drop ads from our database onto existing websites and see what their ads will look on that, like on that placement. Right. Um, Oh yeah, people request it and it's used. It's just not as heavily used as we anticipated. Mm -hmm. And that's surprising when you put a, you know, when you take feedback and you, and you're wrong or off, off base on that feedback. Right. What was something you implemented that was huge, which was a uh, groundbreaking because of the feedback? Sure. I think, I think the countries that we're in, we're in 15 different markets mm -hmm. is all a result of feedback, right? Outside of Canada, the U S and the UK, what what you know what other major markets are important and we really listened to our customers and listen to what they wanted and tried to build a service around that and that diversity has really you know served us well and um has been a large reason that a lot of users use us and continue to use us yeah and you mentioned the growth phase tell me about some of the mistakes and tell me about some of the successes and it sounds like a, a lot around people Sure. I mean, some of the mistakes are, I think, you know, there's there's a wonderful book called Good to Great, which Great I don't book, know if you've yeah. read. Yeah. Um, and Good to Great, one, one of, you know, something that's always stuck, stuck with me there is, are you doing well because you're really excelling or are you doing well because this space is hot and your industry is doing well and you're just growing with the, top, with the water level as it rises? Right. So if you, you know, are you really excelling ahead? And, you know, when, when you're growing at the beginning, when you're doubling in size every single week or every single day or every single month, um, you know, are you really doing that well? And I think at some points we took our foot off the off the gas a little bit, um, not fully off, but we could have pushed a little bit harder or I should have pushed a little bit harder from some of our um, staff members early on. 
and I, you know, and I think that self reflection. What do you mean I think that self reflection. You know, we'll talk about the fishing thing again. I think that self reflection helps you realize that type of stuff. Um, if you have a salesperson that you know has a quota and they hit their quota. Don't be happy they hit their quota. How can you extract more from them? And you know, how can you benefit the company and yourself? And how do you also set the correct positive, you know, role um, as a leader? So it comes from you know the top down. So um, how how do you communicate that effectively with your behavior? Yeah. And I'm not saying we did a terrible job. But I do think there are things that we could have done better. Very honestly. Yeah. So what do you find works with that? With helping people just reach beyond their potential, you know, because a lot of times we I set mean, we, goals. And... We, set, we set goals and then we meet to make sure that we are on track to hit those goals. And we, again, it comes from the top down. So we have a phenomenal executive team that we try to empower and help our um, team members and employees succeed. Mm-hmm. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, it comes from all the way to the top. So my partner and myself. So, you know, um, I'm happy to stay as late as anybody needs me to. If somebody doesn't get something, they can come and talk to me about it. Um, we're more concerned with the result and the journey to get there, right? Mm-hmm. So it would be like um, going to school and saying, well, if you can do um, grade 12 calculus, let's not make, you know, and you're in grade nine, you should go do that. So it's about pushing people to get to where their true potential lies rather than bucking them into, you're the, you've been here this long and this is what you should do. And I think the other way that we help people succeed is we, we let our staff really contribute and have a strong voice about, you know, different things within the company um, because some of our best ideas come from with it. And some of our best, the same way we listen to our customers for features, we also listen to our staff for features because our salespeople and our um, customer support people and marketing people talk to our customers all day long. So who, who better know them than the people that are in contact with them? Mm-hmm every single day. So Max, what did you do right during that growth phase? I think we also did, we also did a lot of things right. I mean, we built a phenomenal product. We built a strong technical um, framework for the product Mm -hmm. and we found the right members for our leadership team. And we built a product that people loved and we aggressively went out and sold that product to people and create a really great base of customers that we were then able to expand upon. What worked with aggressively selling? I mean, I, I can't sell anymore. I'm too aggressive. I just call people. And what do you mean I think, too aggressive? You know, my, my, my sales guys joke that I think everybody in the world should use what runs where. So yeah. we'll be out at dinner and they'll try and tell the waitress at dinner that, they should, <laughs> that she should use what runs where. And I agree. I mean, I think everybody should use what runs where. But, um, you know, I, I personally am very hyper. Um, I like to put one on one together and try and equal three. Mm-hmm. And um, I don't know. I'm aggressive when I, if I want to get something from somebody, I guess. I don't, I don't know, know if the term is aggressive. You don't come off as aggressive. Convincing. Like passionate, maybe. Sure. Is a better word? I don't know. You're not, yeah. you don't come off as like aggressive, but. Persistent, yeah, passionate. passionate. Persistent and passionate. I know what you mean. That's exactly. Yeah, but that's one person. What else did you do? Because obviously you grew fast. What else yeah. did you do that helped you sell to the market? I mean, I think it comes back to that continual innovation. So being able to respond to the market. And when you're a small company, you're able to be extraordinary and agile with what you build into your product. Mm-hmm. So showing fulfillment on promises, fulfillment on innovation, and respond to your market and what they want. You know, is is an important way to drive growth within your mm-hmm. product. So, any other big milestones with the mistake aspect? Nothing huge on the mistake front. I mean, there are lots of. I th- I make mistakes every single day in my life, um, and I believe everybody in the world is. I don't think anybody goes through and has a perfect day where they don't make a mistake. Mm. I think the important thing with mistakes is how you learn from them. So it's being able to say, I made a mistake. Why did I make a mistake? And how do I, you know, evolve and grow from there? Yeah. You said you brought in a great leadership team. What was um, some ways that you were able to find and actually hire and keep 
this great leadership team because that's you know an I mean issue I, I think I think that I think that's where some of that you know very honestly luck comes in. Um, we knew out of out of our leadership team we knew over half the people from previous projects or businesses mm-hmm. or were friends and we were able to recruit them to come and say we have this great vision come work with us mm-hmm. on it. Um, in terms of retaining them, it's about making you know it's about giving people control, not micromanaging them, and um, and and creating great entrepreneurs. So everybody wants to talk about how they want to be an entrepreneur, but an entrepreneur is somebody that can thrive within somebody else's business and really be an entrepreneur within their business. Mm-hmm. So it's how you create phenomenal entrepreneurs within your business that do very entrepreneurial things for you within the com- the confines of your company. Yeah. Do you have, found, have you found something because you've grown fast that works well in your hiring process that other people should be using? I mean, our hiring process is interesting. I mean, we we do multiple rounds of interviews, and it's not we didn't used to, and it's something that we started to do, and we found that dramatically increased our um, caliber of hire um, within our within our hiring process. I, I think. The most important thing is um, understanding how the person fits into your culture, your company, and why they want to be there and what they want to achieve. And we're not every one of our hires is a good fit. Not, and I don't think anybody can say they have a hundred percent rate of no. you know success with their hire. But I think we've got pretty good at it over the years. I think we're able to find you know people that are truly passionate about what we do and want to be here. Mm-hmm. So talk about, you know, you mentioned also a big milestone was acquiring a company and that process was interesting. Sure. So um, about two, two and a half years ago, we acquired a very small company out of the UK called Mobile Ad Spy. Um, and we use that as sort of the basis for our mobile web technology. Um, we had had an eye on them. They were about to release some technology that would have been directly competitive and we wanted to be first movers in that market. So we just approached them and said, you know, what are your plans? Where do you want to go? And we had this brand and reputation. And we very quickly, within about a month, completed a transaction. That's fast, right? Yeah, it was a very quick transaction. It created a little bit of buzz and it allowed us to release a product and it was interesting. But um, from there, we were able, you know, it, it was an interesting process because then you have to take a completely different team dynamic and try and blend it. Mm-hmm into yours and then also you have to change that technology and fit it into your framework as well yeah so how do you blend the team into yours we weren't super successful with that well why why I oh, think, yeah what happened i think physical location has a lot about it with a team being in a different country it's, it's hard to sort of integrate them into your yeah. culture um i love how you're so honest with that by the way yeah and um we we had some personality conflict that you know once the honeymoon phase is done and everyone's you know all nice about it you know some personality conflicts came out but at the end of the day you know um i think we're on phenomenal terms with everybody mm-hmm. there and i think you know it was a win-win for both parties involved and yeah. i think everybody would say that i mean that's going to happen especially if you have kind of entrepreneurs coming together, people have different ideas. How do you handle or work through that when you Mm -hmm. have that conflict, like in that case? I think it's being able to take a step back and it's being able to take the ego out of the room and understand that you're all working towards the same goal. So it's not that they're insult somebody's insulting you personally or somebody's trying to hurt you, you're all working towards the same goal. And where is that communication breakdown? Where don't you understand what the other person's talking about? And how can you do a better job of comprehending or understanding that? Yeah. What else did you learn with the acquisition process that was valuable? I mean, just running through that process is an interesting thing. You know, there, there's a lot of lawyers and there's a lot of, you know, time spent and, you know, the actual base negotiation is an extremely long or difficult part more so it's about the due diligence and making sure that you know what everybody says is true and making sure that you get you're getting what you want versus what you think you want mm-hmm. how did the negotiation uh, go i mean it wasn't 
extraordinarily arduous or long. It was, we went back and forth for a week or so, and you know went back and forth on terms and what and what you know was wanted, and we um, came to an agreement that everybody was happy with. What was a big sticking point in that process? That if you were going back to do it again, you would tell your old self to to watch out for it. I think. I think more so than company due diligence, I think we didn't do enough personal due diligence Mm -hmm. and we could have done a bit more personal due diligence on um, your partner says not, you're not just integrating technology, you're also integrating people. So Mm -hmm. I think that was a big takeaway for us. Mm -hmm. So how fast have you grown over the past four years? Well, we've grown, so four years ago, it was my partner and myself and we've grown from two to 21 people. We've about doubled in size every year, um, and we've done it all. We've never raised any money. We're a self-funded, self-started company that exists because we're good at what we do, and people realize that. I think the fact that we're able to provide you know, 21 people with a living and a way to support themselves is a testament to how we've done. Yeah, pretty remarkable. What's a tough de- decision you had to make on the direction of the company with, your, with the other founder? My well, partner. I mean, I yeah. think I think Mike um, and I are pretty aligned with almost every decision we make. Actually, we, really? we have we have a phenomenal relationship. Um, What's some recently in the past year that were tough decisions that you guys came together and had to make? Um, I mean, I I don't think there have been any extraordinarily tough decisions. I think there have been times where we disagree on mm-hmm. on things, be it hires or direction of features that we have to build or something like that but mike mike and i are like at this point like brothers i mean we've been doing this together for almost five years Mm -hmm. and um you know we both have a thick skin and we sit down and we get what we think out in the open and at the end of the day Mm -hmm. we we make the decision that's i think best for the company yeah well so max what was one of those times where you didn't agree and how you came to terms I honestly can't think of anything off the top of my <laughs> off the top of my head. I mean, we disagree a lot. I think conflict is healthy I, as long as it's not you know lasting conflict where you hold on to. But I think conflict is healthy within a business. I think if you know all you have is yes men that say yeah I agree with you, I agree with you, I agree with you, you ha- you can get into a pattern where a leader goes down a very dangerous path and a dangerous way of thinking without any checks and balances. Yeah, I'm just yeah. curious because you know when you have to you know, strong-minded individuals who are smart, you're not always going to agree. I'm wondering if you have sure. a process to work through some of those things. I mean, we we talk about it, usually somebody has a very logical point, or you know, an example is there are lots of good ideas and things that we want to build in the future mm-hmm. that one of us will push for to do like right now, and the other one will have to say, hey, slow down. You know, this is a really good idea. It's something that we have to put on our roadmap, but we have other things that we have to focus on. And there are core competencies that you need to maintain. Yeah. So what's been another big challenge with running what runs where? Um, I mean, I think um, it's just about can you evolve with your business, right? So I think a lot of entrepreneurs and especially new entrepreneurs are wonderful owner operators they're really good at you know managing a small business with themselves or a couple other people is can you evolve to become a great leader with a larger team right yeah so instead of just yourself can you how do you handle you know 20 50 100 200 people and how can you still get your how can you not lose that vision that communication within the company during that that period as well Mm -hmm. so you mentioned culture you know, when you have start growing, that's important. What kind of stuff do you infuse in the culture to make sure it works? Sure. So, I mean, we, I think a lot of people like to say they're like a family or the company is like a family. And I think that's a very cliche thing to say, but it is something that we truly feel. We, um, we work extraordinarily hard on our culture because we have two offices. We have one in San Francisco and we have one in Toronto that are very far away. So we do... Um, in Toronto, we do monthly company outings where a team plan, where one of our teams plans an outing, and we all go out as a company and do it. Oh, nice. We have um, breakfast in the office every day. We have Coca-Cola products in the office for employees. We have, you know, we have graffiti up on the walls. There's no dress. There's no, you know, strict dress code. So we try and make it 
a relaxed, fun environment where the emphasis is on um, doing your work and you know com and getting you know that done and helping the company succeed over you know wearing a suit to work or anything like that. Um, and then as a company, we have company retreats. So we do one every year hmm. where we go um, and rent a little compound in northern Canada, and we go up there for you know, a couple of days as a company and spend some time all together. Um, not working, but really, you know, yeah. hanging out as a team and, you know, getting to appreciate the people that you work with. Yeah. So what what's come out of one of the retreats? Because when people start bonding, things kind of mesh together sometimes. I think what comes out of it is teams work together a bit more smoothly mm -hmm. and also inter-team relationships get a little bit better. And again, because there are two offices, um, in two different countries and you know thousands of miles away from each other some people this this is the once a year time is the time that they meet somebody that they work with or talk to every single day mm -hmm. so it's you know putting a face to name and you know yeah getting getting to know each other better have you found that any specific positions have been tough to hire for i think you know Sales is an extraordinarily tough position to hire for. There are yeah. a lot of salespeople out there, but there aren't a lot of great salespeople out there. Yeah. Or if they are, they're very hard to find. Yeah. So we because they already have jobs. You think? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So how do you? They have jobs or they already have commission bases that they don't want to leave. Yeah. So we're continually hiring for sales. We're hiring for sales right now, um, and then you know. I think that's one of our toughest positions to hire for because we can teach people about the product, about the industry, but we need somebody that can sell and comes in with a you know set of connections and skills. Mm -hmm. Do you have a training process? How does the training we work do. when they come on? We have a full we have a full onboarding and training process that we run people through that we've developed over the past year or two. And I think the other you know technical positions are also extraordinarily hard to hire for. There's a lot of competition for you know, um, technically proficient people. Mm -hmm. um, so what do yeah. most people miss on the surface of what runs where when they go to the site or they talk to one of the staff? What do, what are a lot of people missing? I think people miss actually how much data we have and that we, you know, we go through billions and billions of advertisements and records to try and help people understand what's happening within that landscape. And I think people don't, you know, realize that it's an extraordinarily high return on investment decision. You know, our base plan started only a couple hundred dollars a month. And if you're spending any money advertising and you can turn a campaign around, you can make, you know, you can make a fair amount of money um, in return, a theoretical return there very quickly. And I think people think that we're a lot smaller of a company than we are still. I, you know, people are a bit surprised when I say, hey, we're, we're 21 people. Because people think it's, you know, we're a small company and they don't realize that why? we're able to. Because the, you two are both so, look so young or why do you think, <laughs> why do you think it is? I, th I think it's more the fact that, you know, we have a complete self-service option. You don't need to talk to a salesperson or a staff person. You can come, you can sign up. And if you don't want to talk to us, you never have to talk to us. So without talking to somebody here, you don't realize, you know, that there are all these different resources and teams available to help you. Yeah. Do you ever think about when you used to do the affiliate stuff and having a tool like what runs where like you ever, I mean, I would, I would, I would have made, I would have made a lot, a lot more money um, as an affiliate if I had a tool like what runs where, which is why we built what runs where originally. Um, do you ever get that itch? I mean, obviously no. you and can't the because you, of, you uh, have, yeah, you have a mandate here that nobody here runs um, affiliate traffic or offers. Yeah. And the reason is, is a lot of affiliates and a lot of performance markers rely on us for advice and insights. It's and conflict we, of interest. there's yeah. a large conflict of interest when we're when you're supposed to be there giving advice and telling somebody, you know, a completely unbiased opinion. If you have another agenda, that's not very good. So we sure. we don't even approach that, and I lose zero sleep over it. I love what I do, and I'm happy to go to work every single day because I love what I do and who I do it with. Yeah. So, you know, Max, since it's Inspired Insider, I asked the question about tell me your lowest point and then how you push through. Because it's, I mean, you've had tremendous growth, but it's not always that easy. I think personally the lowest point was at the end of my first business. I mean, 
Um, you know, I was there, I was making a fair amount of money, but I hated my life. I didn't like what I was doing. I didn't like it, you know, I didn't like getting up and going to work. I was, bur I was completely burnt out. I needed a break, you know. I had been working since I was 15. I was, you know, and to be able to say, hey, I'm, I'm you know, 20 and, um, or at that time, 19. And um, you're already burnt out. Yeah. Already burnt out is a, is a really depressing statement. But it's true. You know, I was waking up every two hours. I wasn't sleeping well any nights. You know, at some point, you need to take a step back and get that balance in your life. I had, I'd gained about 45 pounds over the past year. Wow. Because I wasn't exercising, I was just you know sitting there working, and you know there was there was no work life balance, and I wasn't very healthy. Mm -hmm. So how did you get over that? Started exercising. <laughs> I mean that burnout. I mean no, no, no I know I made I made a joke. How did I get over it? I took time off. Um, I took a step back and you know took a couple months off and really cleared my head and got a fresh perspective and mm -hmm. realized you know what what i need to do and i think that's a lot where a lot of the way that i learned about you know the need for balance you know i'm a very um intense person if i'm you know passionate about something i'll do it until it's done right so could i still work 20 hours a day seven days a week absolutely um my girlfriend would probably hate me but um you wouldn't have a girlfriend i wouldn't have a girl exactly but um <laughs> But I don't think that's the most. That I don't think that's the way to be the most productive. I mean, right? you say you took time off, kind of nonchalantly. But when you're working that hard, and well, I think I think the key you, there yeah. it's not just nonchalant. It's I we took a business that was profitable. There it was still making money and shut it down. Right, that's hard to do. So it's walking away from a decent amount of money. I agree. And, it's hard to do. Yeah. You know, it's, it sort of comes. It comes with that realization that you know, you can. I'm just not happy. Right. Yeah. So I'm unhealthy. I'm not happy, and something needs to change, and something needs right. to give. And at that point, I'm still young. Uh, you know, I can always make money later. But let's let's fix. Yeah. You know, what's up here? Was there a last straw? Because that probably had been going on for a while. I don't think it's. A, I no, no. I just think it's sort of like slow. It was slow, like slow, continual pressure building over time that just sort of couldn't take came it. to came yeah. to head. And one morning, you know. Oh, you know, you wake up and you say, yeah, you know, cool. This is, this is it. Yeah. So on the flip side, Max, what's been one of the proudest moments? I think one of our proudest moments is I think I have a new proud moment every day I wake up these days and I come to work and I see people sitting in our offices working hard. And every time that we add a new team member to our team and a new customer to our product, I think is a new most proud moment. Yeah. What's one where you um, celebrated? One of the successes in the company. I think I think one of the you know things that popped out of my mind is one one of the first trade shows we went to after about a year and a half, and mm -hmm. people were saying, "Oh, you're that you're the guy from Morton's where you know, oh, we love your product and we use it and we use it every day and we love it." And hearing people that I've never met before, you know, sort of recognize you not not because of who you are, but you know where you work for, and because they truly love the product is an extraordinary rewarding thing that that means mm -hmm. more than anything to me. Yeah. Do you remember any, if you can talk about it, I don't know if you can, any particular customer that you thought, wow, this person is using our, the service I created or this company is using the service? I mean, I think very early on, one of our first customers was a bank here in Canada called Scotiabank, which is one of the five largest banks in Canada. And they've been a customer of ours since very, very early. And I think that was, you know, a sort of a pivotal Point because you have a very large multi-billion dollar company saying, hey, we trust your product to, to at least help us guide um, guide our decision-making process in some way. And, um, you know, that gives you the confidence to go after other com very large companies. And I think, you know, I think a lot of people that start, start companies don't realize that um, you can go and you can, you know, if you have a great product, Everybody should be using it. You just have to have the confidence to find the right person and knock on the right door. Mm -hmm. So who are your mentors? And I want to hear some of the good advice they've given you. My mentors? Well, we have a fantastic board of advisors, and I feel like each one of those people are my, are my mentors. Mm -hmm. um, we have board meetings where we 
sit down and we bounce ideas off them and they help us with you know decisions and i feel like my father is an extraordinary mentor extraordinary mentor for myself and um my late grandmother was also you know a phenomenal mentor for my grandparents founded a very successful clothing business in london ontario and then um sold that business and although it's a completely different business they we're very early version of, you know, a dollar store, buy in bulk, sell cheaply. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, there, there are certain learnings that transfer across businesses, right? Yeah. So really there is about, you know, mm-hmm. less so about how do you approach specific problems, but how should you think about problems? Mm-hmm. And just, you know, being able to converse with those people and, re- and understand how they think and then see, see, can I take pieces of that and apply it to my business. So what are the great advice has your dad given you throughout your year? My dad given me? Yeah. I mean, I talk to my dad. My dad gives me lots of good life. I have a very healthy relationship with my father. Um, I think the best advice my father's ever given me is never think that you're the smartest person in the room. Mm-hmm. You should always assume that there's somebody smarter than you in that room. Mm-hmm. And I apply that to any room I walk into. Um, because if you don't, if you assume you're not the smartest person in the room, there's always something you can learn from that other person or right. somebody else in that room, and you know you should go seek that out and figure out what that is. Mm-hmm. And you'll ne- you never know, you know, who somebody can be and where that can lead you, right? Yeah, for sure. Um, and the same way, you should give back to others because you never know where that person will end up. Or you know, when you talk about talking to new entrepreneurs and new men and doing some mentorship myself. You know, you never know how successful somebody's going to be or, you know, could, could I be talking to the next, you know, Bill Gates or, right. or Mark Zuckerberg or, you know, Elon Musk right now and, you know, in 20 years look back and say, wow, that's, that, that's awesome. Yeah, yeah, you just don't know. What about your board advisors? What's some good advice that you remember? Our board really helps us on day-to-day and technical operations of the business. Yeah. So there and i can't talk about a lot of it but it's about you know if we have generally yeah if we have a person if we have a personnel problem or if we have a challenge a lot of them have seen it in their businesses right and they've they've all been very successful so how have they tackled it how can we take what they you know sort of in the same way that board runs where it helps you understand what other advertisers have done and where they've tested how can we take other people's experiences and make sure we don't make the same mistakes there how often do you have the board meetings once a quarter once a quarter Yeah. yeah And so what have you found works with the format of the board meeting so you get the most out of it? Because I'm sure you have sure, busy well, board we, members. Yeah, we do. And we prepare an entire agenda and we have sort of an, an update. Um, here are things that are going well. Here are problems and here are things that we need. Here are discussion points we need advice on. We have everybody into our office. We cater the meeting and we have um, either my partner or myself lead the meeting and then our board members sort of chime in with questions. And then we send out a recap mm-hmm. after that. And usually we find a number of sort of takeaways and action points that we need to do from there. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, if you can't talk about specific instance advice from the board members, what's a general piece of advice that sticks with you from one of the board members? I that, think it's, guides you know, I'm, 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 you know, and I've got less emotional as I've got older, but being, you know, still a fairly young entrepreneur, I get, you know, emotional about things, you know, uh, the business is still my partner, my baby. And, you know, you want to protect your, your child so yeah. i think it's just being able to take you know yourself out of it and take the ego out of it and make the right decision for the business and not let your emotions it's hard to do uh, though grow up it's extraordinarily hard to do but sometimes you need that person to give you and say you know hey just calm down a second look at it it's not as bad or you know take a second and, and you know make the right decision yeah, yeah. so tell me yo max what are some of the good piece of advice you've given because I know you teach entrepreneurship and uh, what you try and instill on the, the people you're your mentor. Sure. I think with any entrepreneur, you need to find um, a product market fit. So I'm bare, you know, I'm a huge proponent of just getting a prototype out and just building it and then finding customers. I think when you're starting something, people will be a lot more lenient with you. Um, and they don't expect your product to be perfect. So mm-hmm. don't sit there and just think, I'm going to build a perfect product. Build something, get out there, prove park, product market fit um, quickly, and then iterate from there versus sitting there and building this grandiose product that then ends up you know, being used by nobody. And if, you know, I think 
the other reason, the other thing that's important is to understand if people think your idea is a bad one, why do they think your idea is a bad idea? And what can you learn from that? You know, I had um, a friend of mine when we started work on where come and sit down and say, Max, you know, stop this, come work for me. You know, you'll never make a penny doing this. This is a terrible idea. And literally, you know, we already had customers and all of this kind of stuff. And I said, you know, I don't, I don't agree. But why do you think so? And he gave me his sort of feedback. And um, well, most of it was, I think, misguided. There were specific points about, you know, um, certain customer segments we go after, and mm -hmm. um, a bit more volatility there. And then, you know, it's how to figure out how to mitigate that that risk. Mm -hmm. So yeah. being able, you know, I think it's important to sort of seek out people that think you'll fail yeah you know if again you don't want just yes men you want them yeah you want them picking apart your business in a sense right it's that because you, it builds you you build a stronger business mm -hmm. what are some of the common questions you get that you think other you know young entrepreneurs should know i think the most common you know question I get is people ask me, you know, do you think this is a good idea, mm -hmm. right? And in the same way, and I'll give very, very honest feedback, but it's not that question is how it's phrased. Like people are looking to somebody else for validation on their idea. Mm -hmm. I think that if you're building something, you need to be extraordinarily passionate and confident in your idea mm -hmm. and, and your product. I mean, there's nothing I love more in the world than online advertising and online advertising intelligence. Mm -hmm. It's my passion. Um, and, and you tell them use what runs where and find out. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I think I think I think you have to be passionate about what you want to do, right? Yeah. And um, in the same way that you have to listen to that feedback and take other people's criticism, you can't go in there saying, you know, I'm vulnerable and weak and I don't believe in what I'm doing. Just please tell me I'm on the right path. You have to think I'm on the right path. Right. And you know, can I can I build? You know something better with your feedback, but at the end of the day, this is where I want to go. Yeah, I mean, it kind of goes back to what you said earlier, which is, you know, it doesn't matter. You just have to get customers and see what they say and change it accordingly. Yeah, I mean, the example I like to point out, you know, is Noah Kagan, and you know, um, Noah has this whole thing where you know, make a business where where he he sold a thousand dollars of you know beef jerky. With a you know quote unquote beef jerky business, you know beef jerky subscription business, and you know I guarantee you people would have, would say that's a terrible idea. But he went out, he got sales, he proved a model, and you know there's there's that sort of nucleus that you can then build around, and then you have to be you know not afraid to pivot and change and be you know reactive, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So you know Max, also you know I have to ask you this question: your predictions for how buying media is going to change? Because you sure, have to have I'm, your finger on the pulse of this stuff. Sure, I mean, and we've already seen it try and change. I think um, programmatic buying is something that's, you know, increased over the past couple of years and the, the trend will continue that, you know, soon a large portion of the media that we buy will be bought programmatically. That doesn't mean what that do you mean direct- by programmatically? So through ad exchanges in an auction format. So each impression sold on auction based off of data and bidding and putting different data sets together mm -hmm. um, versus just a, Jeremy, you have ads on your website, I want to buy an ad on your website mm -hmm. and let me come give you money. Mm -hmm. um, and the reason is, is it cuts down waste, it produces a higher fill rate, and especially when you use data and demographic and targeting data as well as you know, different types of data that you can collect now, you have more efficient, viewable, you know, advertising mm -hmm. um, that is much more relevant to who you're trying to target. Mm -hmm. In the same way, that doesn't mean that direct buy will go away where you do that. You would just put your inventory on what's called a private exchange where I could still buy that in the same, you know, sort of environment that I'm buying all the other media through. Mm -hmm. So what are, are there certain ad exchanges people should be looking at? I mean, I, a lot of people buy media through what's called a DSP or demand side platform. Mm -hmm. And there are a ton of demand side platforms out there. It's just find the one that, you know, is, is right for you and that you have a relationship with. Mm -hmm. I, we, we can't be super preferential. Yeah. As I mean, some, someone, what do you, what do you suggest someone Google to find 
the right one for them? Just DSPR platform or what? What should I mean, be? I think I think it depends how complex of an advertiser you are. You know, if you're a brand new advertiser you're starting and you have a very small budget, there are self-serve platforms like Engage BDR, First Impression, Site Scout. Google has one. Like it's there, are, there are platforms you can start with there. Mm-hmm. Versus being, you know, a very large advertiser with a complex budget, going to one of the very large DSPs like Data Zoo, X Plus One, Radium One, Turn, those type of partners. Mm-hmm. So, Max, how do you see what runs where evolving to stay with the trends ahead of the trends? Sure. I mean, we we have technology that helps us, you know, understand that ecosystem, and um, and we are able to speak from a position of strength and knowledge about it, and help people understand that ecosystem. And I think it's about con- being continu- continually able to see where the industry is going and building you know, your product and, um, you know, build and continuing to make your product relevant, right? So it's how do you, how does your product evolve and how does your information evolve to stay relevant with what's mm-hmm. coming? Yeah. And, you know, I, I will say, I don't think there's anybody better in the world at that than my partner. And that's, you know, a, you know, a huge thing that we lean on him for. So what do you, when you get invited to speak on, you know, advertising, what you know what do you try and have the audience take home at the end i you know i think people should be able to take home something actionable from any kind of talk so i think there's an education portion of it that's extraordinarily important where it's you know here's education about the space or here's education about the topic you're talking about but here are also takeaways that you can take and you know put into your advertising today right so things like, you know, how do you refresh, you know, banner blindness and burnout and how do you, what are some easy little tips to refresh, you know, your click-through rate, um, such as like putting border, like different colored borders around your ads or changing your ad creatives a bit differently to sort of revive a campaign mm-hmm. and squeeze more life out of it. And I think that, you know, if you give tips like that, they're just very, you know, simple takeaways that mm-hmm. people can take back and that work for people. Yeah. It, it gives a good foothold to yeah. come back and look at the rest of the talk. Yeah. So what what are other some simple takeaways for people that they should be doing with advertising? I mean, my favorite one is and ugly works. You know, some of our most successful banners that we made internally for what runs where we have a lot of really pretty creatives. Um, we run retargeting banners for our service to market to people to come use our service. Mm-hmm. But some of the greatest ones we made in paint, right? Um, and it's because people aren't expecting that. You know, you see all this nicely branded stuff, and if you have something that sort of sticks out, and it's like, you know, the the ugly duckling, but you're going to notice that ugly duckling and hopefully engage with it. Yeah, yeah. So what are some, you know, tell people obviously where to find it, the site, we mentioned it. And I want to also hear some of the resources that you think complement what runs where. What's going on lately? Where should people, what should people check out on what runs where? Sure. I mean, you can find us at whatrunswhere.com. So that's whatrunswhere.com. You're very good at saying it. A lot of people can't, you know, have, have trouble saying it. It's a tongue twister. It is a tongue know. twister, yeah. We try and get all our staff to say it 10 times fast. But, <laughs> um, you know, in terms of resources, I think there are a phenomenal number. It depends what stage you're at and how and how technically complex you are with media buying. But I think a lot you can find a lot of the information within our. We have a free resources section at whatrunswhere.com, um, where you where there are a number of ebooks and case studies and industry reports that you can go and download for free nice. and see some of our data, as well as you know co-branded and you know interesting reports with different partners about different you know pieces of the industry there. And um, so just under the resources tab, correct? Yeah, okay. You just go to re- it's all free, you know. We, we want people to learn and be educated, yeah. And I think you know, it, it the resources people should use are completely you know, um, dependent for their business. But some things that we love and we use, we use something called Trello internally for our product management. Mm-hmm. And we actually use it throughout every team in our company for, you know, list creation, task management, and task completion. We find that's phenomenal. Um, we use HipChat for internal team communication and love that tool and find it extraordinarily effective. Mm-hmm. Um, and besides that, you know, it's 
same same set of tools. I mean, we use Google Apps for business. We use Gmail. Um, yeah. So what I think I think the strength I think the strength of what what people should take away or try to build is build a great network of people that you know and people that you can talk to and lean on. And I think that's you know more important than almost any tool that you can have for your business. Mm-hmm. So what's exciting lately? What's exciting you lately with with what runs where? Well, I mean, there are, there are a lot of stuff. I mean, we have a lot of new data coming out into the product. Um, like what's we, top secret? Uh, no. <laughs> well, I can't tell you because it's top secret. I mean, we, in the next, you know, couple months, we'll have a couple very large announcements that we'll be making. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's extraordinarily exciting. There are a bunch of products and projects we've been working on for about a year that are finally coming to you know fruition and culmination and where we'll be looking to roll ourselves into the market yeah. so it's just about sticking through that that vision and making sure that you complete what you're trying to do yeah. yeah max this has been fantastic last question for you you know people should check out what runs where and the resources and uh, it's interesting how you have the office stats this isn't my last question but you have a heavyweight boxer on staff we do we actually, one of our staff members is actually the amateur boxing heavyweight champion for Pennsylvania. Wow. Yeah, so it's cool to see that, you know, it, it kind um, of shows a little bit of your culture and your About Us page with those funny stats and, you know, languages people speak and dogs and cats and that kind of thing. <laughs> um, so what's one last thing we should leave people with before we part i think i think the important thing and the last thing that i'd like to leave with is um people should take that leap of faith i think a lot of people don't do something be it you know entrepreneurial um because they're scared or because they think that you know i'm gonna fail so i shouldn't do it i mean i think you should take a calculated risk but i think taking you know if you don't risk anything there's no reward. Mm-hmm. You're not going to sit there and success is going to fall into your lap. You have to go out and take it. And starting something is sort of like jumping off a cliff and not knowing what's at the bottom. Is it, you know, a trampoline? Is it pillows? Or is it, you know, sharks and spikes? You know, mm-hmm. um, so I think you have to take that leap of faith and, you know, trust yourself that you're going to come out of it well. Yeah. Do you think you got that because you saw your parents building a business early on? My, I mean, neither of my parents built a business. My my parents are both in public service, mm. and my my mother was an educator. I think. Oh, your family, um, I meant. But like my you said- my grandparents built built a business, and I but I don't think that that um, influenced it. I think it, I honestly think it's because I was so young, right? It's sort of the you know when I first started my first business. It's sort of like I feel like an old man now, but I'll, I'll give you an example. In the summer. Um, on my lake, there's a cliff. It's about 30 feet tall. It's very deep underneath. People jump off the cliff all the time. And we do it too. But I remember the first time I jumped off the cliff, I did it because there were two, like, the kids couldn't have been over like, six years old that were just throwing themselves off this cliff without reckless, with just reckless abandon. And they were making fun of us as, like, there were a group of us up there. They were making fun of us as they were doing it. So we all jumped off. But I think it's, you know, the fact that there's just, you know, no fear because there isn't the experience to teach you that this is what hurt feels like mm-hmm. and this is what failure feels like. So I think, you know, you have to take that out of the equation and, you know, say, go back to sort of being that mentality of a kid and you're invincible and, you know, let's just go for it. Yeah. Max, always a pleasure talking. Thank you so, so much. much I appreciate it. Thank you.